This episode is brought to you by FX's Justified City Primeval. Based on the best-selling Elmore Leonard novels, Timothy Oliphant is back as Marshall Raylan Gibbons. His hair is grayer and his hat is dirtier. A chance encounter sends him to Detroit where he crosses paths with the Oklahoma Wildman, a violent sociopath, and his powerful defense attorney who finds herself caught between cop and criminal. FX's Justified City Prime Evil premieres July 18th on FX. Stream on Hulu. This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Wyndham. Wherever your work takes you, you know it's going to be a good time because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. They have free breakfast, fully equipped gyms, and free high-speed Wi-Fi to help you take care of any last-minute business or help keep you in the know on all things sports. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you triumph. Book your stay today at LQ.com. This episode is brought to you by Gero Formulas. Say probiotics, and you think of gut health, right? But did you know our vaginas could benefit from probiotics too? Gero Formulas Femdophilus has two strains native to a woman's body, one billion CFUs, and is clinically studied to help balance yeast. So if your vagina is feeling a bit out of whack, try Femdophilus. Shop Gero Formulas, J-A-R-R-O-W, women's probiotic at Amazon. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Welcome back to Tennis Unfiltered with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the i-newspaper. It is Wimbledon Massive. I'm not quite sure what the best terminology for it is, but we're recording this on Sunday night, just 12 hours before Wimbledon gets underway for 2023. We've got Calvin Beton, our tennis coach, and George Belshaw, our resident writer and broadcaster. We're all in the same city, uh, and yet life being life, we're unable to all be in the same room. But, uh, you know, it's a start. It's a start. Uh, Calvin, you've been down in London for a, a couple of days now. I, firstly, I have to ask you, how was the Boodles? Because I know you were up there uh, yesterday playing some exhibition tennis. Uh, yeah, it was it was different. We didn't <laughs> get to really experience too much of it because we because we, it was organised late. We actually just got the car in there and traffic was terrible, so we only arrived about fifteen minutes before the lads went on court. <laughs> um, walked through the most probably the best house I've ever been in. Mm. Um, to get there, which isn't actually the house at Stoke Park because no one else is allowed it anywhere near that. Yeah, um, there was a lot of uh, ex Secret Service military men around. <laughs> Apparently, the gentleman who owns the place um, employs them year round because he's the ninth richest man on the planet, or something. Yeah. Um, and then the actual tennis was was pretty good. Um, Luke and Julian played against. The City Pass brothers, and uh, for about a set and a half, it was serious, and then it turned very exhibition y um, <laughs> after that. So, um, yeah, it was enjoyable, and they had free cans of Coke and posh sausage rolls. So, <laughs> I was happy about that. Ever the Yorkshireman. Uh, George, you've had a slightly there, less. There was actually, I'll say that there was a real scene where, because basically there was there was no meal. I think they'd done a dinner every night, but because yesterday was the last night, they didn't do a dinner, so it was a an afternoon tea. And there was a real sight to behold where one of the waitresses was trying to explain to Stefano Sitsipas what a sausage roll was, <laughs> um, and he didn't really understand the concept of it. I mean, I this week had to go through watching someone explain to Andre Rublev what a scone is, so I, I can feel your pain. Yeah. Um, and actually, when you try and describe a scone, it is quite hard to do. It's like, well, it's sort of like a roll, but it's not a roll. It's sort of stodgier, but no, it's nicer than that. Um, eventually, we just had to show him one, and then he was like, he wasn't very interested in it actually. Um, but anyway, George, how are you? You've had, you've had a birthday weekend, right? Well, James, I was going to say I'm surprised you didn't uh, start off the podcast asking Calvin to sing me a rendition of Happy Birthday, so it's, <laughs> as it's my special day today, and because I'm sure everyone would love to hear Calvin smash that out the park. From, I no think that's the that. kind of thing that we would have to charge for. There's no way we're getting Calvin to do that for free, surely. <laughs> I mean, that's... We... What's that... Um... That website, is it Cameo? Cameo, Celebrities yeah. to do kind of... Calvin Betton and Nigel Farage just getting hawked <laughs> out to, 
do weird things on camera. Yeah, I think that would yeah. be about right. Um, but I've had a very lovely week, the weekend of lots of random birthday activities ranging from going to a community sauna on Friday, which was quite an ex- interesting experience. It's a community you... sauna a euphemism? No, no, it's not. Yeah, I can actually understand why you might think that sounded a bit more dodgy than it was. Um, <laughs> it's, you, it's basically like, it's in um, Hackney, and they've got this kind of, of a series of saunas dotted around outside in this kind of open space, and then some like barrels and baths. It's just like a bath outside that they've filled with like cold water. And it's like you go from the sauna into the plunge pool in and out to, at your leisure sort of thing. It's quite good fun, but quite random. Um, good. So I did that and then went to a jazz gig last night. It was a good laugh. Um, oh, I've just seen Kyrgios has pulled out. Of one yeah, of the yeah I was, I was literally show. about to say something, uh, George. Breaking news here <laughs> on the podcast um, that will infuriate newspaper editors across the uh, country because Nick Kyrgios has pulled out of Wimbledon at the 11th hour. Um, it is 10.15 on Sunday night. He was due to play David Goffin tomorrow. Um, <laughs> what an absolute nightmare for everyone involved. Uh, he says, I'm really sad that to withdraw from Wimbledon this week. During my comeback, I experienced some pain in my wrist during Mallorca. As a precaution, I had it scanned came back showing torn ligament in my wrist. I tried everything to be able to play, and I'm disappointed to say I just didn't have enough time to manage it before Wimbledon. I'll be back, and as always, I appreciate the support from one of my fans. Um, I don't really know who wants to start on this. We're obviously just kind of reacting to it live. I was, I had Nick Kyrgios written down as something to talk about, so <laughs> we can <laughs> jump straight to that. Um, Calvin, I guess it's kind of a testament to... When you don't play tennis regularly, and, and okay, he's not necessarily chosen that this this year, but you know, but your body is, it, it goes through a lot, doesn't it? Uh, he's not a serious tennis player. He's not a serious person, and he's not a serious tennis player. He doesn't train. This kind of thing happens. He's not having bad luck with injuries. He doesn't train, so he's going to keep picking injuries up. He's mm-hmm. a big name in the sport because he's got a massive serve. He's got an all time great serve, and he's and he's a bit of a gobshite. That's the only reason anyone really cares about him. And as we saw last week, we'll, we'll get on to the bigger issue with Nick Kyrgios later on, I think. So I've definitely got something to say about that. But um, but it's no surprise. I, don't, I didn't expect him to be at Wimbledon. Like, how can he have been? He hasn't played, he's played one match since October. Hmm. George, are you similarly unsurprised? <laughs> yeah, I'm not that surprised. I mean, my, um, my mum and sister are going to Wimbledon tomorrow and they've got caught one ticket. And I was sort of saying, wow. <laughs> You've got an amazing lineup on paper, kind of Sviantek, you know, Goff versus Kennan is kind of quite a big first round tie. Even if Kennan's, you know, well out of form on paper, that's quite a, a an interesting first round tie, I suppose. Um, and then Kyrgios versus a former top ten player. That's that's not a bad set of kind of first round matches. And but I was sort of saying, well, the thing is about the Kyrgios one is. I'm not sure how fit he is. Goffin could make it kind of quite awkward. I can see it more likely ending quite quickly in a massive tantrum where he is swearing and kind of throwing things around um, and not being fit. So I suppose they have uh, they don't have to sit through that um, at least. But yeah, I'm not hugely surprised. It, it felt like, I think when any time anyone's pulling out of a pre-slam tournament because they're worried about an injury, that doesn't normally bode that well. Um Obviously, Sviantec's probably just broken that rule slightly at the French Open. But <laughs> typically speaking, it doesn't go that well if you're not kind of a serial champion and doing it for kind of, I know I can win slams anyway, I'm just going to protect my body. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a shame. I, I've probably got a degree more sympathy than Calvin with Kyrgios on, on this one. I think, you know, this has been a bad injury this year. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a bit of a shame he's not here. But that said, he probably could have started his comeback a bit earlier if he bothered to kind of do a bit of the clay or kind of go into some challenges. And that maybe leans into Calvin's point a little bit more there. No, George, it, it kind of does. But also, it's, it's an it's injury he's had, but he doesn't train. If you're a professional athlete and you don't train, you will get injuries. Yeah. You will get injuries. It's not an impact injury he's had. It's not like he's had a freak of luck and broke his leg. He doesn't train. That's what's going to happen. He's a big guy. He's a big unit, and he's got a lot of fast-twitch muscles. That's allowed him to play like he does. If you don't train, you don't do any injury prevention. It's going to happen. He's had injuries. He has injuries all through his career. 
So it's, it's no surprise. He's a part-time tennis player. Hmm. I think he would claim that he's put in more work over the last, like, like I mean, I, again, like we, we kind he of claims he's the best tennis player in the world. Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of I'm not disappointed necessarily. Like you tear a ligament in your wrist, that's life. But like it's a bit weird because Nick Kyrgios did a press conference this morning or lunchtime today, and you know he was like, "Oh, I've been hitting with some really good players. My body's feeling okay. I'm going to take it one day at a time. I'm not looking forward and putting unfair expectations on myself. I'm just going to try and do everything I can." It's like it's a bit weird, and I mean not disrespectful, but just like. You know, for the tournament and for everyone around the tournament, everyone making plans. Like, wh- when he turned up for press, I was like, "Oh, okay." Like, he's he's gonna play because, like, I I like everyone else. I was like, "Oh, I wonder if Kyrgios is gonna pull out." Um, and then of course he doesn't, and he turns up for press, and I'm like, "Oh, well, this this like he wouldn't bother. He doesn't want to do press, so he would have like you know put it off if he if he didn't you know think he was gonna play." Um, so pretty pretty brutal to fans in Australia waking up on, you know, the first day of Wimbledon because I think it'll be, you know, people will just be waking up in, in Oz now to, to find that Kyrgios is out. Um, I was just sort of flicking through his quotes, really, to see what's interesting. But, of course, no, nothing really is interesting now because it's all very much been overtaken. So I suppose we can move on to Calvin's viral tweet of the week, which might start needing <laughs> its own jingle. Calvin's viral tweet of the week. Um, which was regarding Nick Kyrgios, of course. Uh, people may or may not have seen that uh, Nick Kyrgios reacted to the news that Saudi Arabia are in talks with the ATP Tour to invest in it. Uh, Nick Kyrgios reacted by saying, all in caps, I won't shout. Finally, they see the value. We are going to get paid what we deserve to get paid. Sign me up. And then followed that with, uh, and I think it's 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 money bag emojis. Um, like, I don't think anyone was particularly surprised that Nick Kyrgios was quick to uh, jump on that particular bandwagon. Um, and will be taking the Saudi dollar as quickly as he possibly can. Um, Calvin's incredibly popular tweet says, Nick Kyrgios, a man who has been... Past the first week of a major only once since in the last seven years. He's never won a Masters title. A career high ranking of 13 seven years ago and who has earned £13 million from tennis is finally going to get paid what he deserves. Um, Calvin, I'll, I'll do the fact check that lots of people did on uh, on Twitter for you that he did actually, he's made it twice past the first week of a major, but I don't think that really uh, diminishes your, uh, your point, does it? Uh, well, some people thought he did. About 10 people replied <laughs> saying that my point was moot, moot because of that, which I, I don't think they really understood the point if they thought that. But yeah, I, I forgot a week. Um, I forgot one of the, the slams that he made quarters of the final US Open last year. Um, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, it, I just found it astonishing. Right? And, you know, I mean, I ended up muting that tweet after about three hours because there were there's nothing that brings out the idiots of society more than... Middle Middle Eastern states owning sports hmm. um, recently, and I found that out both with the football club that I support and now with the, the sport that I work in. Um, but I, I just find it amazing how how many people just aren't bothered about what goes on in Saudi Arabia and the people that they're going to get paid by, um, and especially being that athletes have close relationships with journalists and knowing specifically what happened to a journalist. Um, in recent years, um, knowing what they're like with human rights. I, f- I was astonished to see Billie Jean King coming out saying that she backed the Saudi, um, she backs tennis getting money from Saudi Arabia after mm. all that she's campaigned for over the years. Um, but money talks, as we keep, you know, it's a, it's a phrase that we hear all too often. And apparently, even when Billie Jean King is just ditching her morals and ethics and everything she's campaigned for over years and years, which are specifically female rights and LGBTQ, gay, LGBTQ yeah. rights, but she's just going, oh, you know, it's something that we need to look at. Then that shows you where, where the world is heading. Really. And tennis, I guess, is, you know, it's an inevitability. It seems an inevitability that they will come in. And then, you know, I saw, I thought Andy Murray was somewhat misquoted earlier on. The first time, the first quote I read was that, he says he's gonna he's gonna play in Saudi Arabia, and the second one where he said he's gonna have to have a serious think about what he does, which I don't I don't think are the same things. 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read you what he said. Um, he said, in the past, when we were asked to go and play there, and to, for reference, he was offered, allegedly, £1.5 million pounds to play there. We were asked to go and play exhibition tournaments. If they become major tournaments on the tour, it becomes a slightly different question, and it's a difficult one, really, based on how the tour and the rankings and everything work, how important they are to get into other events and stuff. When you start missing them, you obviously get penalised for that. It's definitely something I would have to think about. Unfortunately, it's the way a lot of sports seem to be going now. Yeah, I think you're partially right, Calvin, that yes, he's not saying I'm going to play there. But I, I think given that literally two weeks ago, he said I wouldn't play there, which is a re- repetition of his yeah. stance has always been. To then say that, I mean, I think it's pretty clear what, what his direction of travel is. Yeah, I mean, I also take real issue with this idea that tennis players, de- tennis players at the top of the de- game deserve more money. I don't know where this has come from. Well, I do know where it's come from. It's come from Novak Djokovic and basically Nick Kyrgios. But tennis players at the top of the game are play, paid very, very handsomely. Mm. Are they paid as much as footballers, basketball players, golfers? No, but the sport isn't as popular as those. If they yeah. want to get paid more, start making the sport more appealing. And it, that's up to them. It's up to them and the people that run it. Just going to Saudi Arabia and say, give us more money. That's not, what, that's not how things should be going. Mm. Um, and then... I'll, you know, and I'll come back to Nick Kyrgios as well, is that this idea, I've, I've known, I don't know him personally, but I've known what Nick Kyrgios was like for some time. And there's, there's been this illusion from certain people, and George has peddled it a little bit, that he's actually a good guy. That's never been the case. He's not. He's a bit, he's a bit of a bully. Some people like him because, you know, that's, that's how human nature works. But this sort of thing, there's been little things of these up like this over the years, and this just sums it up. He has no interest in what, what is morally and ethically correct, as long as he's getting paid. Mm. I, I mean, I would say that over the pandemic, like I definitely softened to him. I think he did some good stuff then, and like I was like, okay, yeah, I can kind of get behind this. Like, uh, and I probably did buy the kind of misunderstood maverick line but um and i'll let george defend himself but i i I think yeah you have to take that in the context of everything else and the the reality is that most people want to like people and especially people like uh, you know i i have to see nick kyrgios a lot i have to write about nick kyrgios i have to deal with nick kyrgios and so i want to like him so when someone offers me a bit of evidence i probably give it a bit more credence but he also offers a hell of a lot of evidence that makes you not like him, and, and that and that kind of puts people the other way. George, I'm going to let George defend himself. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I, mean, I was going to say the other other example that was quite good was the bush fires, wasn't it? In Australia, he really took the lead on a lot of that stuff. You know, I I, I think as we have every human being, there's a complicated. You know, people can be good in certain instances and not in others. And I think mm. James makes a very good point there. You know, we do want to like Curiosity. He's fun for the sport in terms of the way he plays, how he, you know, having that swagger. You know, we're talking about making tennis more popular there and how they could earn more money. If he wasn't a part-time tennis player and was playing all the time, there'd be far more eyes on, on tennis matches than there would be if he wasn't part of the sport at all. So, yeah, of course. But I, to be fair, I do think I always caveat he is a bit of a twat as well. I do I do kind of say both sides. As you know, I sit on the fence on most things anyway. Um, but, yeah. It, it, but, yeah, on this... It, it, it's not great. And I think I would also strike a note of caution with um, not just with tennis players, but all sorts of sport. You know, I think the, the, the fact of the matter is it's kind of like water going through a gap, isn't it? it, it as it's dripping through, you're trying to get Nadal and Djokovic out to Saudi Arabia for £1 million. Pounds. It's a huge issue. But now so many sports, so much money has been flowing through that everyone's kind of like, oh, it doesn't matter. And that, you know, to a degree, that's life. That is what happens. But is that money going to be there long term? I don't know. Is it going to be good for the sport long term? Look at the WTA taking loads of money from China. That didn't really work out that well for the WTA for a long period when things kind of ran into trouble. You know, stuff like this, people get bored. Tennis isn't that great an investment right now. It's not selling itself well enough. Look at the docu series, the break point. Is that really cutting through like other sports? Have been. It's, it's, it's not the easiest sell. It, it's. I mean, the the docu series that that kind of thing just pisses me off again because it's like tennis just lets itself down there. It could have made a really good docu series, but it never. It always lets itself down with this kind of stuff and likes to make everything a bit flowery and a bit. You know, it, it just it's a PR stunt really. Whereas the other series, I, I've not seen the golf one. I haven't seen the Formula One one, but I understand they're very much in 
they very much give a glimpse of what it actually is like in those sports. Whereas the tennis one just doesn't. It's just so airy fairy, really, isn't it? Um, with regards to Saudi Arabia coming into tennis, I'm intrigued to know what they're actually going to try and do. I mean, they can put a tournament on, they can put 250 or a 500, and then it's up to the players whether they decide to go and do it or not, whether they decide to play it. My feeling is they won't do that, so that's not how they tend to do things. They'll be coming in big, they'll want to buy the sport, they'll want to buy one of the major tournaments, one of the Masters series, which are, um, and that's where it gets interesting when they're mandatory tournaments and whether the ATP are telling players you have to go and play in Saudi Arabia. And I think that's where you've got, you've got somewhat of an issue. Um, but, and again, this is, when we talk about lack of characters in tennis, this is where, this is the problem, is that I'd be looking now for somebody to come out and a few players to come out and make a real statement. I won't be going to Saudi Arabia. That's not what I'll be doing. But they're not. There's a lack of character. There's some good tennis players around there's a lack of character in the sport, and and that's what I think will will get shown up if if this if this does happen. And on you know last word on Nick Kyrgios, I do think he's good for the sport when he's playing. He's you know he, he's whether you love him or hate him. I, I, I think he's, a, he's you know he's a fantastic talent. There's no question about that. But and um, you know he gets people to watch tennis, but he never plays. You can't. He's always banging on about going up. Oh, people say I'm bad for the sport. I'm not sure anyone really say no one in in numbers actually says he's bad for the sport. Mm. That's just something he's created in his own head. But he can't be good for the sport because he's never playing it. It's, it's what? It's nine months. And he's played one match in nine months. He's As I said in that tweet, he's just never at the last stages of tournaments. Twice in seven years, he's been in the second week of a major tournament. It's You can't be good for the sport if you're never actually playing the sport. I think um, that that lack of character point, Calvin. I mean that 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 is, as you've already said, you know, that's where the Murray and kind of Billie Jean King comments become more yeah. disappointing. And I, I think the Murray one particularly, because as you say, I do think it's a slightly different question if it's a grand a grand slam or something <laughs> to a degree. But you know, the idea of it being a five hundred or whatever, and people choosing to go there, you know, that's a pretty clear, I feel stuff. But I. If I'm Andy Murray and I'm 36 in my career, not needing a huge payday, if that's a Masters 1000, I'm saying, yeah. nah, I don't yeah. need the money. I'm saying, no, that, that damages my reputation. And if it's a Grand Slam, you know, in inverted commas, you know, he's just chosen not to play the French Open because he's not bothered about the points. I don't think a Grand Slam for Andy Murray that's in Saudi Arabia makes a difference at this stage. I mean, come on. Like, that that is one person who really is at the stage of his career now where he should be like, I don't care. And it's harsher to hold him to a higher moral standard than Nick Kyrgios. But but really, actually do there. I think, you know, as you said, Calvin, he is a bit of a twat. He is a bit brain dead. And this has been his stance for a long time. But Murray, you know, I I like Andy. I think he's a nice guy. And I do think he thinks about things a lot more. I actually would expect a lot lot better from him on something like this, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean disappointingly for me, I've, I've been around for the last few weeks on the main tour. And there aren't many people who are not going to take that money. I can tell you that much. And, yeah. you know, without naming names, there, there, there is, there's certainly enthusiasm and lots of it. But I think it's down to, I, I, I think it's down to, I guess, the media to, to go to, to really press the players on this. What do you think about these issues? And I don't want to hear any, any bullshit false equivalence of like, well, you know, that Disney's owned by through 3% owned by uh, such and such Saudi Arabia and the Shards owned by Qatar and stuff like that. Anybody who thinks that a building represents the same as a sport that you love or a TV channel or a supermarket represents any kind of emotion is that's the, and that's the same as a sport that you you know and love and have followed all your life. They're not worth talking to. I don't want to hear that kind of bullshit from any players. And I guarantee you, there will be some of that from some of the players because it's the same nonsense that football managers and clubs and supporters pile out every time this kind of thing's questioned upon them. Yeah, I I, I do think you know if we're talking about you know the top of the game being very well paid in tennis that is true if players outside the top 100 150 are involved in this equation and we're talking about them getting a baseline salary of 500 grand a year 
I totally understand that cohort thinking, God, that's that's life changing money to give me the chance to make it in a sport that's really difficult. That is, a, you know, that's something that's that. career. That, that's where it comes from us. You know, I'm saying if someone offered me that sort of money, it would be really difficult because my life is not like that. It's not com- it's not so comfortable that I can't not work again. But you know, there is a difference there as well. I think. I think so too and the reality is that these tours don't work if the big players don't go like if if everyone outside the top 100 said I'll take the money and go to Saudi but no one in the top 100 said yes then it would fall apart it wouldn't work because it, just no one would no one would pay it um, no one would watch it and, and so it would eventually fail so yes you can concede that those people would and probably should take the money but actually, the people who already have all the money also have all the power, Calvin. Yeah, I think, you know, this is because I'm, I, you know, a couple of the coaches that they think it's comedy. They'll wind me up on this issue of, of Gulf states owning sports because a lot of the coaches and players think it's funny that I get so irate about it. But it's a, it's something that I feel strongly about in sport is the one thing that I truly love, whether that be football or tennis or many other sports. And I don't think it should be for sale. But everyone will come to me. Oh, so Calvin, if if uh, if Saudi Arabia came and offered offered uh, Luke Johnson and, and Henry Patton uh, ten million pounds each to go and play in their league, would you tell them it's a disgrace? And look, it's not something that I would do, but I understand it more if it's life changing for people. And mm. and I guess for, I mean, not even for those, but then you know they say to me, what if one of your mates got offered a a four hundred percent pay rise to go and work there? If if I can kind I can see the argument there because it's life changing for them. If mm-hmm. it means that they can provide a, a brilliant life for their family, which I don't think it would be living in Saudi Arabia, if I'm honest. But um, I, if they think they can have a, have a fantastic life for their family, then I, I, you know, it's not something I would I would do. But I don't have a family, so I can't comment on that. But I wouldn't I wouldn't take massive issue with that. What I take massive issue with is already people who are already wealthy beyond all recognition who will never have to work again their family will never have to work again going and taking more money from Saudi Arabia or Qatar or um, Abu Dhabi or whatever yeah can't really say can't say any fairer than that to be honest quite frankly um, yeah it's going to be an issue that dominates uh, Wimbledon I suspect uh, Carlos Alcaraz said at Queen's that he would go and play there Igor Shontek said today without really saying it she effectively said she would i think she said i'm ready to play wherever basically um i'm ready to play wherever the wta decides we're going to play that's what she said she said it you know it's just a rumor about saudi arabia it wasn't official she would wait for that but i mean to say i'm ready to play wherever the wta decides we're going to play is i mean (laughs) Like the implication. I, can go to next week. <laughs> I mean, you're putting your faith in a pretty unreliable body there as well. Like, it's not like you're saying, "Oh, I'll go wherever NASA says." Calvin. I, I think as well. I'm just. This is what we're dealing with, and I, and I don't want to hear talk of, of racism and that kind of thing because I'm talking not talking about the country. I'm talking about the people who run these countries. And this, I'm going to read you something from, um, that is a tweet from a guy who is unofficially the sporting PR person of Qatar. Because Qatar, Barcelona have just, I don't know whether anyone knows, but they're talking of setting up a Barcelona football club in Qatar to play Mm. in the Qatari league. But Barcelona yesterday have, um, they they put out a tweet where their badge was covered in the rainbow um, of LGBTQ, that sort of thing. I'm just trying to find the, the tweet here. Wait a minute. Yeah, so here we go. This guy from Qatar, who's their unofficial PR man for their sporting arm, uh, uh, that he's re- retweeted the FC Barcelona badge with the, the rainbow around it, and he's put, let's enjoy football away from any other disgusting things at FC Barcelona. Hmm. Hmm. It's not good, so, is it? It's not good, and that's the problem. There's no indication that they're going to change their ways to become more inclusive or yeah. stop murdering and chopping up journalists. And, and, and you know, Qatar... <laughs> Andy Murray's been taking the Qatar dollar for years. Like He, he has played in Doha multiple times, yeah. presumably with pretty hefty appearance fees involved. Um, like I think the golf thing's basically just changed the whole landscape. I think 
when the PGA Tour sold out to golf, it was just like, well, that's it then. We, if they can do it, and and you know, no consequences really. And also the fact that the players who didn't go originally are getting a worse deal because of it. Everyone's like, well, I don't want to be second. I, I want to be first and get the big money, not the less big money. But well, also, I think, like, the, like, sorry, go on, Josh, sorry. I was just saying, in terms of the timeline as well, I mean, you know, I'm pointing to that Nadal Djokovic one. Well, since that happened, you've had Anthony Joshua go out and fight there as well. I mean, it's, mm. it's a harder thing for British, British journalists to kind of start slagging off basically all all these people again when loads of our British athletes have now gone off and done it even quite revered you know it's a huge kind of watering effect that makes it much more difficult and quite tight I mean this I don't mean this in a, a negative way because I know a lot of journalists do try and do this but it becomes quite a tiresome thing to report upon when you know there are some people like Miguel Delaney for example you know he has tirelessly gone after Saudi regimes in terms of like Newcastle United you know, and people just say, oh, will you shut up about it? Will you shut up? Editorially, it's quite hard. If you, if you went through every single sport this is happening in right now, there's so much of it. You know, it's such a watershed moment that you, you, you'd have to cover the entire sports section going after them every single day and people would just be bored. And that's a horrible I mean, reality. I mean, Miguel's a friend of mine. Miguel has been physically abused, physically assaulted at airports by supporters of football clubs who, by supporters of Newcastle and Man United, for the tweets, for the, the things that he's wrote on state ownership. And that's where it's getting to him. And then we're told that sports washing doesn't exist. Hmm. When you've got, like, who's defending their owners like that? Tell me, t- tell me 15 years ago, anybody would be fighting with people in airports or threatening violence to defend the owners of their football club. Hmm. Like, it just, it's, it's, it's a really terrible route that sport's going down. And if I'm honest, I don't see how it stops because, like I said earlier, there's so much enthusiasm for it within the sport. Yeah, people just blinded by the money, really. Um, just, just... Yeah. Can't say no to it. Um, right, should we... I mean, this is supposed to be our God We're Excited About Wimbledon podcast. Yeah, this is all <laughs> spiralled into depression, isn't it? What a way yeah. to end my birthday. Cheers, lads. <laughs> <laughs> George relentlessly bringing it back to himself, of course. Um, <laughs> right. Well, let, look, look. Let, let's let's uh, try and go micro again and uh, look at tomorrow's order of play. Um, I guess the one that everyone is most excited about is Venus Williams against Alina Svitolina. Uh, when, as I said, George, when that came out in the draw, uh, there were audible gasps. Um, Calvin, you've been around for almost as long as Venus. Oh, actually, is without. I mean, I was going to ask you without giving away your age. Are you older than Venus? But that would give away your age, so I won't ask it. Um, <laughs> Don't mind. I think I think I'm one year older than how old's Venus? Forty three. Yeah, I'm one year older than. Her. All right, there you go. Well, uh, I mean, she's still a massive draw, isn't she, Cat? I mean, it's a massive deal to have Venus playing at Wimbledon. Yeah, it's funny because I know a couple of the lads who are down doing the, the hitting at Wimbledon. And like yesterday, you know, I said, well, you know, talking to him, I said, oh, you've been hitting with it both like Venus straight away. It's still, you know, still a massive name. And I'm mm. sure they've hit with, they've probably hit with 20 people since Thursday when they started work. But straight away, we've been hitting with, oh, here with Venus. Yeah. And, you know, that's the, um, she just does it. I mean, you know, you, she still has an aura uh, as you see her walking around the grounds. You know, it's still, still very, very, powerful that that aura that she has and i wonder if she's kind of in you know i don't think she's admitting i wonder if she's kind of enjoying being on the tour without serena now it's the first time that she's probably done that since the first year that she came on tour when serena hadn't yet i was gonna say yeah on, on that point i mean calvin you, you I always think of you when i'm thinking about kind of that star quality and how much people brings them into the game when you t- when you're talking about kind of McEnroe and agassi etc yeah yeah um, there's a there's a lab I'm, i do spanish classes with and he, He's a huge William sisters fan, like to the point of kind of obsession. He got really, really into tennis via them, yeah, and now yeah. they're not playing. His interest is waning a bit. He's like, oh, I don't, I don't like them so much. It, it is an amazing in kind of individual sports how much just that that yeah. one athlete or one person can really like draw you in. And you know, the William sisters have, have such huge star quality that, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying I'm not bothered about them, but you know I, I'm not a fan of tennis purely because of them. Yeah. So it's not why I came in, but for so many people, it is a route in via certain people, and they're so, you know, trans- transcending. Um, 
they have brought such a wide audience in that you forget what a big deal they are. Well, you don't. But... I was only th- <laughs> I was only thinking um, like earlier today how when they first when Venus first came on the scene and then everybody knew she had a sister as well who was a couple of years younger that when they first came on the scene that the talk was it was going to be this rivalry between Venus Serena and Martina Hingis who at the time was I think Martina's only like I think she might be I mean I think she's the same age as Venus maybe um and the talk of like what how this rivalry could go on for years and you know it did at the start you know because Martina Hingis was you know she's won multiple slams but she just seems like she's three generations ago mm. now, and Venus is still playing. Yeah, and <laughs> Hing- that's Hingis, staggering. Hingis is actually younger than Venus. Younger by, guess, by yeah, six months, might be. not not yeah. by much, by three months. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is staggering when you point it out, actually. And you know, I mean, it's not like Venus is just turning up and taking wild cards and losing. She did beat Camilla Giorgi, Camilla Giorgi, the other week, and you know, I I don't think it's a I mean, we will come on to predict the result of Svitolina versus Venus, but I don't think it's a, a total done deal that, that she loses to Svitolina. It, she's got a genuine chance. Um, we might as well, as, as I uh, kind of hinted at the other day, we're going to do in each mini pod um, three predictions. Well, we're going to do four predictions, but one of the matches I picked uh, isn't happening anymore. So uh, <laughs> thanks to Nick Kyrgios. So we'll do three three predictions uh, tonight, well, I was going to say, if you're after a fourth, we could, if it's not already on the list, we could do Sinner Cherindolo, seeing as that's really got my back up this week. What a good idea, George. Uh, well, we will we'll do the first one, which is Venus Svitolina, uh, and you can start, George. I need a result, and I also need in how many sets. Um, I've been, get, I've been an hour about this quite a lot over the weekend, because I was considering whether to take Svitolina for fantasy, and I... I I wimped out of it in the end um, because of just who Venus is. I, I do think Svitolina is going to win, and I do think she'll actually win in straight sets. But she didn't have a very good grass court result in the one match she played, which has filled me with enough dread to not make the fantasy prediction. But I do just think Venus at 43, before that win the other week, she hadn't won a tour match for about two years. I know she's up for it on a big occasion, but Svitolina's... It's not not someone I'd expect to be overawed by it. You know, she's been in big matches before, um, even if her ranking's not where it is right now, and she'll be up for it as well. So, yeah, I, I think Svitolina does it in straight sets, to be honest. Calvin, disagree, agree, partially agree? Um, I think it's a tough one to call that one because we don't really know where Svitolina's at. She, her yeah. comeback was pretty... Like, she wasn't really winning much until the French Open. And yeah. then she won a couple of really good matches. Um, I think you probably have to make her a slight favourite, but only slight favourite, I think. Um, two, either too close or well, maybe three sets for me. That. So are you taking Svitolina in three? Yeah. I have to write this down, so I have to I have to have clear <laughs> consent. Um, Which doesn't suit me, because I like to sit on the fence as well. I know, normally, so. I know. But there's a spreadsheet, <laughs> George, and everything. Uh, right, well, we'll move on to Sinner versus Sherandula, and I'll ask you for your predictions shortly. But George, are you you're... out of this game, James? No, way. sorry, you, I, I had home. already written it down. I've got Svitolina in three, and I, 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 w- I almost went Svitolina in two because I think Venus is pretty cooked. But um, yeah, I, I just yeah, you can just see Svitolina getting nervous. Like as you say, I think she's obviously been at the top of the game before, but she's also like been someone who doesn't necessarily challenge us in the second week of slams and. Centre court day one, like it's also good. The like, centre court's really green, like really green, like really lush. Mm. Um, there's a bit of weather around. Like I just, I don't know. Just think there might be might be issues. Um, right, George. Without shouting about it too much, uh, because you're on a dodgy mic. Um, why are you so annoyed about Yannick Sinner versus Juan Manuel Chirondolo? <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to say I'm that annoyed because I think in the context of our earlier discussions, it puts into perspective how uh, silly some of these scheduling conversations are. Um, but I was, I, I think I was more surprised than anything about this one. Like, I think in my own head when I'm thinking about scheduling, I, I try and understand the rationale. And I think a general defence of schedulers, and what I think is kind of fair, is, you know, what would ticket holders want to see on day one? What's actually kind of a pull in terms of broadcasting? Um, 
and I do think there should be a degree of fairness in terms of male and female representation um, and particularly for big names and treating both sides of the sport with respect and I just have to say I think you can make a case for this match potentially hitting point one in the sense that you know Sharon Jola is quite a high ranked player he's been pretty high up in the world and Sinner is a good tennis player it, it could be a decent match I guess it might be. I wouldn't put my house on it being a brilliant match, but it it could be a good match. But the other two, I, I, it just doesn't just doesn't qualify for a first day on centre court match for me. Sin is not a big enough name to the outside world. He's had one half run to Wimbledon where he you know made a bit of a fist of it against Djokovic. I get there's the idea of he wants to promote you know the sport wants to promote people who are coming through. But to me, to have Igor Sviontek on court one, for example, rather than Yannick Sinner, or to have, you know, Kyrgios, you know, I know this match is off now, but Kyrgios versus Goffan, for me, is a better match than Sinner versus Chirindolo on paper, you know, whether Kyrgios is fit or not is another question. Even there's a case for Goff versus Kenin in terms of someone who's got star, probably more star potential than Sinner against someone who's actually won a Grand Slam before. I don't know, I just I just felt this really didn't tick any box. Oh, the other ones, you know, reason I understand the schedule is doing it is like a Brit going on there. I don't think any of the Brit matches really deserve it, so that, that's kind of fine. But yeah, I don't know. I just I just thought it was a really odd one and it would go down as one of the weirder first day centre court matches I I can remember really. The problem is with it, and I was I was talking with somebody about this earlier on almost the exact same conversation. And I was saying to them that the problem is that you've got to put matches on court one. Court one tickets are expensive. They're mm -hmm. only about 20 quid cheaper than centre court. So you can't just go and get the best matches and put them on centre and then choose the next one to put them on one because you've got to really sell court one. Centre will sell itself, but you need to convince people if we put, if you buy tickets for court one at well, however much they cost, but like I say, they're only about 15, 20 quid less than centre. You're going to get some decent matches, so I think it's. I don't think it's um, that they've demoted Swantec. I think they've they've basically said we need to put somebody, we need to put some star quality on court one, and she's that. And I think that that's the that's the reason that I think Swantec's on there. That you need to sell court one because if you just had court one of say like the matches you've listed there, George, if you just had the best, if you just put the best matches from court one on the centre. Along with the best match, you know the 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 best match from centre on centre, and put the others on court one. Court one's looking pretty shit, and th th there also isn't there also isn't many great matches in the first round, if we're perfectly honest. And that that's the problem. There also, again, don't want to sound too depressing about tennis here. There aren't many stars. Like who who are your draws, and that kind of thing. I mean, you're going to have like Tuesday's going to have it's going to have probably. I imagine Murray and Penniston will be caught, will be centre yeah. without a doubt. I think Penniston and Ferry will be will be one. I assume Medvedev, uh, Medvedev uh, not Ferry, Penniston. Sorry. Medvedev Ferry yeah, will yeah. be will be caught one. I would think. Yeah. So you've got your two big Brits ones there. I mean, Lofhagen's playing Rune. I don't know whether that gets a a, a show caught. Maybe not. But again, I think it'll get in? probably two. Sorry. Yeah, I would expect yeah. Rune yeah. versus yeah. Lofhagen on two. But you've got, like okay. I say, you've got it. It's not just a case of go, of saying, oh, you know, that's uh, that, that should be on centre because you can't put, or you can't just put the, the four best matches on centre. Like that, that's think... that's not how it works. No, 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 I don't think it's entirely how it works. I mean, you know, I've been talking about Tuesday because I'm going on Tuesday. I do think there's some kind of un, there are some sort of written and unwritten rules. Of course, tomorrow you've got Djokovic has to be on centre because. He's opening the tournament as the men's champion. Yeah, you know that that's on there. Tuesday, Rubakina will be on centre because she's the defending women's champion. And you know we could also argue the talk about whether it'd be nice for that to be swapped over every year or whatever. But anyway, as it stands, that that's how that is happening. Then I know Andy Murray will be playing Ryan Penniston, even though to be perfectly honest, I mean, it'll be nice for my friend who's coming who you know hasn't seen much of Murray before. In terms of a match, I'm not that interested in that. Although you know. Whatever, that's fine. And then I was thinking, what the hell is the third match going to be? You know, I'm worried they're going to kind of try, try and ba balance it into uh, another women's one because they've now put two men's matches on the Monday and the women's matches on Tuesday. I'm, 
I just oh, I, don't, I, I just don't think there's a great round one match that qualifies for center in terms of you know having a big enough name versus a good player etc so sorry um, do you think that, that, that whatever the women's match on tuesday on center is going to be rubbish is that what you're saying yeah, I think it'll either be really one-sided in the fact. Yeah, so they could go for like Sabalenka, for example. Yeah. If she's on Twitter, and she'll hammer who she's playing. So That's me right, as a yeah. fan going, I think that will be rubbish, and could be over in an hour. That that's how I'm looking at it. To be honest, I think Murray, he, he might not do this, but he could hammer Peniston. The Rubakina match is okay, but also kind of accept the unwritten rule. And then I'm kind of thinking, you know, if I went there to Centre Court on Monday and Team Sissipas, for example, was on Court One rather than Sabalenka versus whoever on the third one. I'm not just saying in terms of women here. There are some bad men's matches as well. If I'd have got Sinner Serendolo over Kyrgios versus what, uh, Goffan, looking at it, I-, I wouldn't have been that happy with that, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And I know what Calvin's saying about they've got to sell court one, but I still think on Monday there are enough big matches to kind of do it and get away with it. Like Goff Kenin could have gone up. Sviantek could have gone up. Kyrgios could have gone up. Sinner Serodolo is a fine, okay, court one match. But yeah, I, I just thought it was a bit a bit bizarre, really. I mean, I, I, do, I do know what you said. I do, compl- I do agree with you, to be fair. But also, I do think it could be a decent match. I mean, I think, look, it wouldn't have been that. That wouldn't have been the centre court match if Cherendolo. Cherendolo's just won in um, Mallorca, hasn't he? Is that, that, is that not his brother? Is it? Well, I mean, let I don't me know check. which I don't know which Cherendolo it was. I don't know well, which. This, I, I is, this, this was... is the Juan Manuel Cherendolo, uh, and I believe the the left-handed one, uh, and I believe the other Cherendolo. Yes, is the one who won in Mallorca. Oh right, no, then that's a rubbish match for centre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As you were, I thought I, I just looked at Cherendolo. I thought it was maybe seeded, won't it? I don't know why. I didn't yeah, exactly. That. Yeah, but no, yeah, um, yeah he's going to absolutely tonk him. So oh great! Well, there, that. Calvin, your prediction then: Sinner in straight sets. A single one hundred percent straight sets, you know, for that one. George, are you going to say the same? Yeah. Right. Well, uh, on the basis that uh, I don't trust Yannick Sinner, I'm going to differentiate and go Sinner in four. Um, yeah. If it, if, if Sharon Dola listens to this podcast, he's going to be right up for it to prove yeah. us wrong, isn't it? Absolutely. So him in five, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. We're going to do quick hits on the last two predictions. Then, um, Katie Swan versus Belinda Bencic, George. Why do I think Katie Swan might win this? Uh, there are reasons that I'm not going to disclose until everyone's put their predictions in. She's just been rubbish. Uh, she's not had injury problems and she's just not been very good, Benchich, um, just with a bit of a British crowd behind. But is Swan good enough to take advantage or consistent enough? I don't know. I, I'm re- this one, I really... If you'd have asked me five minutes ago, it would be a different answer, to be honest. Um, I, I'll be really brave and I'll go for Swan in three, but... That will look ridiculous when Benchic thrashes a six-one, six-love or something. Calvin, I think you're going to go the complete opposite end here, aren't you? Um, I, I'm. I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to see Katie Swan win because she's a nice girl, and also she gets coached by one of the best uh, young coaches in Britain, Alex Ward, uh, who's a, a friend of mine. Um, I, I get the feeling that Benchic. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Benchic wins in three, have, with Katie having had opportunity to win it. Hmm. Uh, I'm also going to say Bencic in three uh, because she's barely played, basically, um, but probably has enough, I suspect. Uh, right, finally, um, the inform Yannick Hanfman against Taylor Fritz, uh, which was me kind of scrambling around a bit for uh, <laughs> for another interesting 50-50. It's not a 50-50, but uh, Calvin, you can start. Taylor Fritz in how many? I think Fritz <laughs> will win. I think Fritz will win in five. Fritz in five. I like it. George? Um, I think Fritz is good on grass. I've picked him for fantasy. My team name is uh, White Wine Fritzer, which I thought Calvin uh, would enjoy because it's his drink quite... of choice. Are you a White <laughs> Wine Spritzer it. man, Calvin? <laughs> I've never had, <laughs> never had one in my life. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I get... Go um, and do cocktails. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think Fritz probably... Does it in three or four? I'll go for three for Fritz. Fritz in three. Excellent. We've all gone differently on that one, albeit the same winner. Um, the scoring is very simple. It'll be one point for the right result, three points in total if you get the score correct as well. 
Um, I will try and post scores on Twitter fairly regularly, George. Just, just a check from a fantasy perspective, James, for people who've chosen Kyrgios, do they have a chance to change the teams while I'm Yeah, great, great point, George. Uh, yeah, your your team is editable. If You should get an email uh, after you enter with your team on it, and you can click through that link, or you can just, uh, you should be able to click back into the form, and yeah, you can edit it. I've taken Jock, uh, Kyrgios out of the form, so um, his luck, the lucky loser actually isn't going to get confirmed until tomorrow because of sign-in. But um, it, if he signs in, like assuming he hasn't flown home, um, Fabian Morojan uh, is guaranteed to uh, to be the lucky loser. I'm reliably informed. Calvin, is it is it right that you literally have to sign in physically, or like can you be like I'm literally waiting for my plane? Please sign me in. Um, no, you you have to be there. Um, yeah. To do it, I, I think it's so. I mean, it's, it changes at each different tournament, so. At the slams, it's just they don't draw them out of a hat. It's the highest ranked player that lost in the last round of qualifying that gets the lucky loser. Um, whereas in lower down the tournaments, it's varying degrees of they're all drawn out of a hat or the players with a ranking are drawn out of a hat and then the players without a ranking are drawn out of the hat after that. So if there's three players with a ranking, they'll be drawn out. They'll get one, two and three. And then four, five, and six, for example, will be the players who don't have a ranking. But in the um, in the slams, it's just the highest ranked player who lost in the last round of qualifiers. But you do uh, you do have to turn up and uh, and sign your name. Yeah, I mean, most players won't go. To be fair, because the money's so good in the slams, yeah, you and you get they'll get they'll get if they're in the last round of qualifiers, they'll get their accommodation for um, until tomorrow anyway. Right. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's I got to say again. I might be making an assumption here on Kyrgios, but it's poor form because now he basically takes half his money as well. Yeah. And I don't oh, see I, I don't think there was any way that he was playing. Um, Someone just checked just... me that as well, saying that quite cynically. And, you know, we've got after people yeah. in the past who've done that. And it, it, did he, he did it in Australia as well, didn't he, this year? It is, you know, that is, I do think, kind of poor form. Equally, I do sort of, I understand the rationale that players think they've earned that money. Already, you've earned it if you've played. Yeah. You've earned it if you've played. <laughs> hmm. He's um he Fabian Morosia, I can tell you, he was still in London seven hours ago, according to his Instagram. So uh hopefully he's uh he's hung around and he will uh get uh get into qualifying. Uh, can anyone hear my washing machine finishing? Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. So happy I for have you. a Samsung washing machine that plays a German f- German piece of le- um opera music called The Happy Little Trout when it finishes and lots of people at home will <laughs> recognize that um because they too have a samsung washing machine that is too loud i mean you let it finish i think that would drive me up the bloody wall after yeah the first, my, the first my, time. my missus hates it so much but fortunately she's in costa rica so she's not bothered um Don't right that, turn it off. uh there probably is a way but i'd rather not i like it it's sort of comforting oh you like it okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and she hasn't worked out how to turn it off yet. Uh, so uh, we, we persist. Right, that's all we've got time for in our Wimbledon preview podcast. I apologise for it coming out late, for it being sloppily recorded, for all sorts of things. Um, but hopefully you appreciate that we took the time to do it. Uh, we will do daily podcasts during Wimbledon. We'll do daily predictions. Um, enjoy it. That's all I can say. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. Sports Social Podcast Network.